So I, I knew you had the Packer connection. Yeah. Uh, yet another reason for us to not do a podcast together. Right, because your and team here we broke are. my boyfriend's collarbone. Yes, and I'm rooting never for you. I'm so sorry. I believe that each and every one of us has the power within ourselves to create the life that we really want. And I want to help give you the tools to make that happen. I'm Danica Patrick, and I'm Pretty Intense. Today is the very, very brave Gretchen Carlson. Uh, she's a journalist, a whistleblower, and uh, an empowerment advocate. The things that she's doing nowadays to change the laws to give women more of a voice are brave and important. Her, her bravery is changing the face of culture. But what you didn't know is that she was a prodigy violinist she was Miss America, and of course then she went on to be on television and become a household name. Gretchen's a wonderful, great girl, and I hope you enjoy this episode. Are you a Vikings fan? Oh my gosh, yeah. yes. You love football, right? I oh my like gosh. That football is your favorite sport. I, football is my favorite sport. Me too. I still put on my jersey and my uh, tennis shoes that are purple <laughs> on Sundays, just even if I can't watch the game, just to be able to be there in spirit. And I'm constantly tweeting out what the score is. And then, you know, our hashtag is Skull, S K O L. Why? Which is because it's Scandinavian and we're Vikings and I'm Scandinavian. Jag talar svenska. Are you, uh, so I'm Norwegian. So oh, are you Norwegian? Svenska. I'm Swedish. Oh, you're Swedish. Okay. Yes. So we're not supposed to like each other, actually. Oh, <laughs> that's a bummer. But, but, you seem well, lovely. Well, no, just growing up in Minnesota, my grandparents used to speak Swedish when they didn't want the grandkids to know what they were talking about. And so I vowed I was going to learn how to speak Swedish. And anyway, my grandfather was very much a humorist and he told jokes all the time. And so when you're Swedish, the butt of the jokes were the Norwegians. So sorry about that. Yeah. Jeez. But we can change it so that we can at least do this podcast. Together. Yeah, I think we, we need to unify. Yeah. Um, but I'm a, but us I'm a huge Vikings fan. Or us, us, us Scandinavians. Scandinavians, yes. But the, the interesting thing is with my children, um, especially my, my son who you know, is a huge football fan as well. You have two kids, right? Yes. My daughter's 16 now. My son's 14. But he'll be rooting for like the New York Giants. And I'm like, what are you doing? And then I'm like, oh yeah, he lives here. <laughs> he was born here, yeah, right? <laughs> and it's like, it's like my whole idea of being the Minnesota fan didn't transfer over. Uh -huh. But the, the interesting thing is my husband was a Vikings fan as um, a child because he grew up in Columbus, Ohio, and they didn't really have a team. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he could have been Cleveland Brown friend or Cincinnati Bengals, but he chose the Vikings. So maybe is that's he a big college up. fan then? Oh yeah, Michigan. The Ohio State. No, what? he was he was he was a um, trader of sorts because he got a baseball scholarship to Michigan, and so he yes he crossed over the line and <laughs> and he takes my son to the Michigan Ohio State game every every year in Michigan. Or, or either one, either one, yes, and they wear their blue and yellow. Well, I had a defying moment where I, because I grew up near Chicago, and so I was a Bears fan all my life, but of course now I'm dating the quarterback for the Packers, so I'm a Packers yeah. fan, and I have a place downtown Chicago, and so my girlfriends and I went there for the first game of the year. It was actually the first game of the NFL season, and we went to breakfast, and at breakfast, more people had Packers clothes on than bears and really? we were in Chicago yes well, and bear. so at that point in time we realized okay let's all put our gear on and we walked around town all day that day before the game in our Packers clothes and you know people were really nice people they were, were really nice we're like hey will you take a picture for us and like yeah sure I thought for sure they'd be like throwing stones at us and <laughs> that's till they get drunk at the game <laughs> yeah. and yeah. then they're throwing spitballs at you or something, I, or something worse. But I, yes, I, I knew you had the Packer connection. Yeah. Uh, yet another reason for us to not do a podcast together. Right, because your and team here we broke are. my boyfriend's collarbone. Yes, and I'm rooting never for you. I'm so sorry. Um, so it's I really do nice not to like meet the you. Green Bay Packers. Thanks for coming. I know, I know. <laughs> but but he's a great quarterback. I will give you that much. I mean, I'm an admirer of talent. That is a common theme. Yes, he's he's very he's very gifted. Um, I just don't like it when he beats us. Well, so we'll see. One down, one we'll to see. go this year. So wait a minute. The Packers, they San, seven San Diego beat them, but you, the they Chargers don't call San Diego did. anymore. L.A. The Chargers, LA Chargers. The Chargers beat them. Yes, they're seven and two now, 
And uh, but I know that one of the games that was really like one of them that he put a lot of thought to as far as, you know, how it normally goes and worried about is he was worried about playing the Vikings. Yes. And um, and we beat him. So, uh, but so don't we, one, don't one we more to go you again. This at the end of the year, we go to Minnesota. Yes. So yes. do you ever go to games? Um, yes. In fact, so the Vikings were playing the Giants this year okay. in New York. Oh, yeah. And um, I unfortunately had a speech on that afternoon. I Melissa. know. Sunday, I know. Sunday at one o'clock. And so my son, of course, said to me, Mom, if the Giants win, can I get a Giants jersey? And I said, okay. And then he goes, and if the Vikings win, can I get a Giants jersey? <laughs> And I went, and what does mom get out of this? And so when the Vikings won, after my speech, I was texting him and he's like, when can I have my jersey? I'm like, okay, all right. Yeah, so we have this little rivalry that's going on. But I don't get to Minnesota that much to the, to the games because I tend to like go, to go visit Minnesota in the summertime. Yeah. Yeah, which when makes sense. When there's the state bird, which is the mosquito. Well, yes, yes. The real one is the loon, but the mosquito, but it's better oh, than... Oh, what's the loon? The Minnesota loon? Yeah. Um, I just saw one, actually, speaking of being there in the summertime. Um, they're beautiful. That they're, they're, um, It's a beautiful sort of thin bird with a very long beak, but it's it's known for its um, hoot sound that it makes. Mm. So you can tell a loon because it's like, hoo, 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 kind of like an owl. Is that and actually the state it bird? It is then? actually the state <laughs> okay. bird, yes. Not the made-up one, which is the mosquito. <laughs> um, I remember being up north, so my... My mom's side of the family, actually, my mom was born in Minnesota. Oh, yeah? She was born right up on the state line, north of Bemidji, all the way up to Canada. Actually, almost all of her family, except for one, she's one of five, lives in Canada. Hmm. And uh, there was the horse flies like crazy all hmm. over the place. I remember there was a that we'd go up to their lake house. My and one of my and one of my uh, uncles or aunts, and uh, we'd try. I remember going down by the water, and we just ran right back as kids because you were just getting pummeled with horse flies mm. from the water being so right there. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of nature there. But what else do you, what do you remember about growing up in, in Minnesota and what do you love and what are you so glad that you don't have to deal with anymore? Um, the snow. I OD'd on snow. So that's why I don't take my kids to visit usually in the wintertime <laughs> in Minnesota. It also, you know, didn't help the whole mission when I went to school in California. I went to Stanford so then, I, you know, it's like February studying under a palm tree with mm -hmm. shorts on. Mm -hmm. uh, so that sort of got me off the whole snow thing. But listen, I, I loved where I grew up. Minnesota is an amazing place with amazing people. Um, the values and the, what I like to call now the Midwestern sensibilities. Like I'm still incredibly frugal. Um, that came from like appreciating the value of a dollar. Yeah. I remember asking my dad one time if I could go bowling with my friends because we had a bowling alley just up the street from us on the highway. And he was like, well, no, because we can't afford it. And I was like, dad, it's a dollar. And he's like, nope. He goes, you have to understand the value of a dollar. If you want to go bowling, then you'll have to like sweep the floor before you go. And then you can earn the money you'd be able to go. Wow. And this is the way in which I was raised with these, you know, sensibilities. And I remember cutting coupons <laughs> for my mom before she would go to the, to the grocery store. Um, there's still a real serious frugal side to me. I'm mm -hmm. not a shopper. Um, if you put me in a store, then I'll, I'll look at stuff and I'll be like, oh yeah, I need that. And I need that. But for me to like actually go out and go shopping, it's not in my DNA. Um, What's your favorite all. splurge though? Um, shoes. Okay. Well, those are great. They kind of look Gucci. I don't know what they are, but... Um, they're, they're very much on sale, they... Valentino, which is very out of the ordinary for me. Um, but shoes the are The sale my... or the Valentino? Uh, um, Valentino. Yeah. No, Aww. everything's always on sale for me. Every, you, know, you just got to wait for that right moment. Like To buy it at the top price, no way. Uh, but so shoes... you don't use the girl justification of when no. it's on sale, you're saving money? You're like, no, that's just when it's the right price. Uh, well, I, I just can't bring myself to pay full price for something like, you know, expensive shoes. But shoes have always been my sl splurge because I think being in television, uh, I always sort of had to wear an outfit, yeah. like a uniform, yeah. which was like a, a, a dress that was all you know, one nice bright color. Yeah. And so the only way you could really show your personality was either through your earrings or through your shoes. Mm. And so shoes sort of became the thing for me where I liked to, to show personality. Um, so anyway, being frugal in, in Minnesota and just, you know, Minnesota has this phrase, Minnesota nice. 
And the biggest compliment somebody can give to me still to this day is that you are still the same authentic, real little girl from small town in Minnesota that you were when I knew you way back when. Mm -hmm. And that to me just still is, like I said, the greatest compliment somebody can give me because we can all go on to achieve, you know, great things and work really hard and live in a bunch of different places. But to really be true to yourself and to who you are, it's to never really change and to is treat people you, the same way. Is that what you attribute your reasoning for how you don't change is that you are true to yourself? Yes. And being authentic. And my dad used to always say to me, you know, people will know who you are by your actions, not your words. And that is just so true about being a real person and being authentic. Um, you can always tell somebody who's kind of faking it. And uh, so that that has actually been a central part of my life as a human being outside of my career, but also in my career as a journalist where I'm constantly meeting people and asking people questions. Mm -hmm. The most important thing is to have it not be about you. It's about listening to the person that you're actually asking the questions of. And, um, and so, you know, my upbringing really plays out in my life um, in so many different ways. And as a mom, oh my gosh, I'm trying to give those same Midwestern sensibilities to my kids, raising them outside of New York City. And that can be, that can be a challenge. I would say that my husband and I believe that teaching our kids humility is the most important thing in, in raising them. And it's precisely why I bring them back to Minnesota at least once a year, every year because I want them to see how I grew up and what family life was really about and the more simple life. And they love it. They love being away from sort of the fast paced, you know, New York upbringing. What can you do in the city then? Because there's a lot of people that are going to listen or watch this and think, I don't, li I don't live in a small town. I'm like you, I live in the city and I don't even have family in Minnesota to go give them these values. Mm -hmm. So what do you try and do with them here where things are so much busier and there is so much more stimulus and um, it's not that slower pace. It's not that, na it's not nature. It's, you know, go, go, go and concrete jungle. Yeah. Well, go on vacation to Minnesota. I mean, or Canada. We brought our kids to Canada this summer as well. Uh, I think that, you know, Starbucks is sort of my barometer about how we live our lives. And Starbucks? Stay with me. Stay with okay. me. Okay. So, you know, in New York, when you order your Starbucks, it has to appear like this, right? Or in LA, same thing. But when you go to Minnesota or you go to any other, you know, state in the middle of the country, it can take you five to seven minutes to get your Starbucks. And... At first, when that started happening to me, I was like, oh, gosh, got all uptight and like, what's taking them so long? And then I realized this is emblematic of how people in the whole middle part of the country live their lives in a much less harried, hectic pace. They, maybe they're having more conversation and face-to-face -face interaction instead of being so worried about just getting to the next place. And so, yes, my barometer is how quickly it takes you to get your Starbucks. Now, if it took five to seven minutes in New York City to get your Starbucks, that would not go over very well. So, you know, I really encourage people, no matter where they live, to kind of just take a step back and and realize that things don't have to be so frenetic. Um, and really having those face-to-face -face interactions, especially with our kids in this social media age and everything's oh. their screen and their phone, you know. And my mom has a rule, actually, when we all get together, she makes all the kids not have their phones at the dinner table. That's great. Which, you know, at first they're like, Grandma! You know, it's like a big, huge problem. And she's like, nope, not at my table. Yeah. And she, you know, sort, sort of forces what I'm talking about, this old school way of having face-to-face -face conversations and interactions. And you know what? After a while, they don't, they don't miss it. And we're like playing bingo and making s'mores and um, just having talks. And so, so that's what I, my husband and I feel is like the greatest challenge for us is is raising our kids with humility and with the ability to just take a step back and not be so harried. What kind of activities do they like to do? Uh, um, well, they both love sports. So my husband and I have this yin and yang. So I, um, I love sports and I was athletic. However, m all of my sports careers or endeavors came to a halting, screeching stop because I was a very serious musician. Yeah, you played the violin. Yeah, which is kind of where I'm trying to get to is like, 
what did that, you know, how did that play into your life? Because you were, you were like a prodigy violinist. You yes. were, you were, you could still be playing the violin today. And I'm kind of curious if you can still play the violin. No, um, I don't. It's but, a big long story. But, but this is why I could, my mom made me quit sports eventually because my fingers were like my entire livelihood. Mm-hmm. And, and I broke this pinky finger playing football with my brothers in sixth grade. And she was like, that's it. Hmm. You know, no more sports for you other than like tennis um, where you can't. And this is also why I don't cook until recently, because honestly, they didn't let me touch knives. What? Um, because, it, you know, my fingers were, especially my left hand, was yeah. just essential to what was supposed to be my career. So you asked about my kids. So my kids have the music bug um, and they also have the sports bug from my husband. Mm-hmm. Now, when, when we got when we started dating, I said to him, well, you already, you know, got kind of the jackpot because I already love sports. So are you going to now figure out classical music so that we can go to concerts together and all this? And that, um, let's see, it's almost 22 years and that has not happened. Oh, I know. But my kids kind of have an appreciation for for both, but I don't make them practice at all like um, like I had to do. What do they play? Do they-, they play piano. Okay. And my son played trumpet for a little while. My daughter actually asked me if she could play the violin early on. And I kind of, um, I'm going to tell a little lie here for, to her. And, and re, the real story to you is that I, I told her, you know, that that would not be a good idea. And the reason is because I didn't want to emotionally go through it. Um, hmm. Because it's really, really, really hard for me now because I don't play anymore. And... I didn't want to have like a mini me and expectations of her having to play the violin at the same kind of level that that I was. So we just kind of didn't hmm. go down that path. And they both do do piano. My daughter's probably a little more serious about it than my son. But if I can get 20 to 30 minutes out of them a day, that's a lot, as opposed to the four hours a day I was putting in. So were you afraid that your level of knowledge and your own commitment to the violin was going to play a part in what you saw in her and her level of commitment? And mm. and and if you saw something you could help her with, were you worried you were going to be compelled to fix everything because you knew how and you wanted yeah, to see her want, succeed? I just didn't want her to have the same expectations that I that I had. You know, were they your expectations, though, or no, were they your family's? They were, well, they were both. Early on, it was mine's because I think when you're a kid and you start doing something that that you're good at and that you realize early on that putting time into it, you get better at, mm-hmm. that builds immense self-confidence and discipline. Yeah. So that was really wonderful. So I wanted to do it mm-hmm. because I saw myself getting getting better and I was such a competitive child that that perfectly suited my personality. But then when I got to be like a teenager, there were all these distractions. You know, there were boys and there was school and there was, I wanted to try out for the play. And um, there were just so many different things out there and I didn't really want to invest all that time in just one thing. And then sort of got into that little rebellious mode with my parents where they were like, well, wait a minute, you invested all this time. Mm. We sort of feel like we owe it to you as your parents to make sure that you continue down this path. Mm. And they were not stage parents by any stretch of the imagination. They just, you know, I grew up with them telling me you can be anything you want to be in this world. It's going to take a lot of hard work and we expect you to put in the hard work. Hmm. Um, And I don't, I did not necessarily want my daughter to feel like she only had to do one thing in life. And add to that, kids are so much more busy now than, than we were growing up. I mean, they, now you have to like dedicate yourself to a sport early on. You have to pay it, play it all seasons yeah. long, you know. And school, school, club, work. you name it. I like mean, Exactly. And then the school. Coaching work, outside of school. It's crazy. Um, and then just the amount of schoolwork that kids have now. Oh, really? Is, oh my gosh, it's so above and beyond what I had. And I was a good student, so I was putting in a lot of time to, to study. Wow. But my daughter as a junior has like six hours of homework a night. It's That's crazy. Like um, not even feasible. It, it almost isn't. And so where did where would she have four extra hours to be yeah. practicing the piano? So which one do you think would be better for her? I just wish there was more of a, a balance because yeah. I think we put so much pressure on our on our young people. 
especially where she is right now, junior year, there's just so much that collapses on you. You're starting to, you, you learn how to drive, you get your driver's license, you, you start looking at colleges, you start taking the ACT or the SAT, plus junior year is the most rigorous for academics. And so we just like yeah. dump all this pressure mm. on a 16 year old and say, hey, figure it out. And oh, by the way, on, on the side, you're going to do sports and you're going to practice your piano. Right. Um, you're and you're going to go to church right? and you're going to, you know, do volunteer service. And it's just, it's, it's a lot. And, and I can say that because I had a lot on my plate too as a kid. And I don't think I would have been able to do all of it now in, in 2019. You were accepted to Juilliard school, which is the in New York City. It's in New York City. Mm -hmm. um, but you ended up going to Stanford. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You're such a, so accomplished. Mm. I mean, it's impressive. Um, and then we'll get to the next part, which is being Miss America. But uh, so why did you decide to go to Stanford? And um, so this was part of my rebellious mode. Because Juilliard would have been about playing the violin, right? Yes. Because it's an art school. Yes, um, it is. And so my goal in life when I was a kid and playing the violin that seriously was that one day I wanted to perform in Carnegie Hall, which is also here in New York City. The irony is my very first apartment in New York City, I could see Carnegie Hall from my window, <laughs> except I wasn't playing the violin anymore. Um, and it's ironic I, how life kind of works out. It is so weird. And then uh, Juilliard was like a hop, skip and a jump from my second apartment um, on the Upper West Side. Interesting. But I, so my parents tried to find a happy medium for me because if I, if I really, what they probably should have done if it was going to be my career was have me move to New York City when I was 10 or 11 or 12 years old. Um, but they decided that they wanted to keep me in Minnesota, have more of a, you know, regular upbringing um, or one that they were used to. Are you glad for and, that? Yeah, no, I'm very grateful for that. And so what they did was occasionally they, I came here to have lessons with the premier teacher at Juilliard. And then I went away all summer long mm. to the Aspen Music Festival from oh. age 10 on for nine weeks, where I had intense training with all the Juilliard teachers who, who transferred wow. out there. So it was sort of this nice compromise. Um, I mean, I gave up all my summers, but yeah. at least I could stay in Minnesota as a, as a child. Yeah. Um, so when it came to turning 17 years old, that's when I told my parents I was quitting. How and did you arrive at that conclusion? I just, um, it wasn't like an overnight decision. It, it built up over a couple of years. A couple of things, I expressed earlier that I was just interested in so many other things. Mm -hmm. And I realized that to be the best in the world of violin, I would have to give up everything else in my life. Yeah. And I wasn't sure that I wanted to do that. And another huge aspect of it was that I had seen a lot of musicians who didn't seem happy to me. And I was always a really happy, good-natured, you know, humorous little kid. And good Midwestern it, it, girl. It pained me to think that I would choose a career where maybe I wouldn't be happy. And especially with the tunnel vision aspect of it, where once you go down that path, then you're pretty much giving up everything else. And so I told my parents I was going to quit. It was quite devastating for them. Did you love playing the violin? I did, but it then it you know it just became um, it just kind of got in the way of other things that I that I wanted to do. Even academics, you know, I was a really good student, but it was like, okay, are you going to practice the violin that that extra hour, or are you going to study? And um, so I quit, much to the chagrin of my parents, who were how'd they handle it? They were devastated. Mm. It was you know not necessarily for the monetary commitment they had put into my lessons and all of that. It was more that they felt like one day I would regret it. And that is exactly how I got into the whole Miss America system. <laughs> I mean, it was, it, it was, it was completely because of my violin. How? Because, so I quit and I went, I went off to Stanford and concentrated on my academics. And I did take my violin with me just to pacify my parents. And then I promptly put it in the locker in the music school and never took it out. I was going to say, did you have some sort of like uh, guitar crushing? Like a picture guitar getting smashed? Did you have some kind of no, ceremony for violins it? Violins are worth too much to do that. <laughs> How um, much is a violin? Oh my gosh. Like ones that, ones that you played. Um, I mean... Sixty to a hundred thousand dollars as a what? Yes, but no, but listen, Stradivarius are millions and millions of dollars. What? So, and I actually had an opportunity to play a Stradivarius at Stanford, and I still didn't even play it. That goes to show you how determined I was to try and move away from this, you know, this part of my life. So, wow. 
So yes, and violins are like wines. They get better with age. I was gonna say, there's, and so, it feels like wine. Like, how much is that bottle of Petrus? You know, yeah. and you're like, is it really that much better? Yeah, and, and the amazing thing, not to get off on another tangent, but the, the amazing thing is that they've never been able to really mimic how they made, how the Italians made the violins in the 16, 1700s. Oh, so they're that so, old. Oh yeah. Okay, so they don't make those anymore. Oh my gosh, Stradivarius, no, because Stradivarius died. So he, so the, the violin maker- Oh, makers, Stradivarius is a guy? Yes, okay. he's a violin maker. And um, they're the most famous violins in, in the world. And they're, they're, they're actually owned by museums or very wealthy people. And then they allow gifted people to play them because here's the other really interesting thing about violins. You have to play them to keep them up. You can't just put them in your closet and, and um, you know, have them sound the same way five years later. You have to continue to, to play them. So anyway, I, I didn't do that. I put the violin in the, in the locker. And, do you wish you would have played the Stradivarius? Um, I, have, I have played a Stradivarius um, oh, okay. since that time. Okay. That's good. But That's even, cool. that, even that was not a hook for me to go back to it. So what um, did you love about it? What did I love about the violin? Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Um, like the accomplishment of putting, you understand this, from putting yeah. time into something and getting better at it. And, yeah. And... The most crucial thing about it was that it was something nobody could ever take away from me, ever. And that I think, especially in being women, is so important. That um, it was a power thing. You know, it was like, I'm good at this. This is my talent, and you can't take it from me. And um, that gave me the discipline in life to achieve everything else. You know, people will say to me, "Well, what's similar about?" The, your television career and the violin, and I say everything, because it taught me that discipline of how I approach every day and how I that fire in my belly to be the best that I can be, and the competitive spirit and um, and the performance aspect. Mm -hmm. I mean, going on stage and playing the violin or driving in a race is the same feeling as um, going out in front of the camera and seeing the red light go on. Mm -hmm. You know, it's that rush. comfort zone. It's the rush and the comfort zone because I've been doing that since I'm six years old. So, you know, those things will never leave me. And in fact, I can still see all the notes in my head. I just can't play them. Wow. So it's not like riding a bike. You lose it. You know, my you lose your fingers and your dexterity. Can you play at all? Um, yes, but I would never play for anyone else right now. Is On this... occasion, I'll play when nobody else is in the house um, and I even look at my dog and don't tell anybody. <laughs> don't tell anybody how much how I come? suck. Why wouldn't? No, I, I, I actually would venture to say that you probably are very good at it. No, not Anna. not. And I'll never be like I was at fourteen. Well, of course not. You, you yeah. were doing it every day. I know, but that's the painful aspect of it. Why I don't do it, and I, I really. Why should. do you hold yourself to that standard? Because I think who cares other you, than you? I know, but when you been to that level and you know the time and the energy that it took to to get to that level and to not be able to do that is very sad to me mm. it's um like like I said my brain can still mm. see all the notes but my fingers can't keep up mm. so anyway the my dad is... my dad would love if I went back to it I should yeah. for him but this but... is interesting because it kind of reminds me of my career which was I didn't actually love racing yeah like I don't know if this is true. I don't know if you didn't love playing the violin, but if you just love playing the violin, you just play it for fun, maybe. Because I, can, I don't, like, I just, I loved the challenge. I loved setting a goal and achieving it. That was what drove me, which is something that you pretty much said earlier. Yeah. And it wasn't the driving. And that's how I was able to leave it behind and let go of it and move on because it wasn't about the driving. Like I don't want to go hit the track and just pound around by myself, maybe similarly to what you don't want to just play because you're like, that wasn't it. That wasn't what I loved about it. Um, partially, but I did, I did love the end product that I was able to emote, you know, and yeah. the emotion that went into it and the, mm -hmm. the, um, it's such an individualistic thing, the way in which you interpret a concerto, like, that is so personal. Mm. And so I did love that part of it. Um, it just became a, a, too many other distractions in my life, you know? 
And, and you became Miss America. Well, but that's but so so to that story, which is a when crazy did that start? One. So college. So you obviously went to college. You went to Stanford. Mm -hmm. Where did you? At what point in time did you start participating in pageants? Um, so I had done one teen. It wasn't even really a pageant. It was a um, a teen competition that was based on your grades, your volunteer service, your talent, your interview, and then you put on an evening gown for the end of the night. But um, you're shooing. That was well, and I told nobody I was doing it. <laughs> and then so um, that was my parents' first way to try and get me to still play the violin. And mm. then so I ended up becoming first runner up nationally, and that actually irked me hmm. because I was got that close. And then mm. I was like, okay, you know, what happened? Like it would have been better if I was like tenth or something. Like what happened that I got that close and, you know, it just didn't. So that sort of sat in, in me um, percolating. And then when I, I spent part of my junior year of college studying over at Oxford and my mom called me up, she said, I got this brochure in the mail and it's about the Miss America competition. And it says 50, five, zero percent of your points are based on talent in this competition. And you have that. And I think you should do this. And I said, mom, are you nuts? Well, I said, I'm a tomboy. I struggled with my weight my whole life. Um, violin has never won Miss America. I'm from Minnesota, which is not thought of as a pageant state. And by the way, I'm short. <laughs> and by the way, I'm not only just in some kind of town in America called Oxford. I'm in England, right? Yes, you're right. And I'm far away. England. And I wanted to stay for a summer program that I had worked my full head off to get into and she was telling me now, oh, just rescind that offer and come home and enter the first tier of competition. They really wanted you to play Miss the violin. America. They did. And, and they um, believed in you. And she believed in me. And so I, even after I told her all those negative reasons why I shouldn't do it, she said, I don't care. <gasps> I, I believe in you. And I think that you should do this. My mom's really been inspirational and influential in my life. She's been my biggest supporter and my biggest critic. Mm. And so I came home. And that's exactly how it happened. And then I entered the, the first competition that summer, and then um, that made me eligible to enter the state competition. So I went back to Stanford for a quarter, and then I realized if I'm really going to go gangbusters for this thing, then I can't stay at Stanford and try to get to the level of competition that I need to be. I mean, I had to go back to practicing the violin in a really incredibly serious way. And so I dropped out of Stanford. What were you studying at Stanford? I was studying a bunch of things. I mean, it's sort of the story of my life. I couldn't decide on a major. And so I ended up self-designing my major in organizational behavior. If I had used it, I would have been uh, like a corporate consultant, like a problem solver. And I was, my intention was to go on to law school. And so the whole Miss America thing. You're so amazing. then I dropped out of school and went back home to prepare and then, um, and then ended up being Miss Minnesota and then just three months later was the national competition which is what I, I knew like so that's why I was plotting ahead like okay well if it would happen to work out in Minnesota I won't have enough time to prepare for the national competition with only three months so that I was kind of working backwards realizing I had to leave Stanford and again I told nobody when I went to the female dean to tell her that I was stopping out which was what we called it she was like, why are you stopping out of Stanford in your senior Is that senior dropping year? out? Is that basically like the casual, like that's the professional way of... Taking a break and oh, okay. you know, stopping out with the so intention you come of coming back. back. Yes. Okay. And she looked at me and she said, what, what are you going to do? And I said, um, I'm going to try and become Miss America. And she was like, are you nuts? That's the craziest thing I've ever heard in my life. The dumbest thing she might have said. <laughs> so I told nobody and went home and... And really just... Um, what does preparation for Miss America look like? Well, practicing the violin again, ridiculous amount of hours a day. Wow. Um, researching every possible news item and, you know, doing a ton of mock interviews because... Is that what got you into news? Well, kind of in a weird way because 30% of my score was interview, 50% was talent. And then, of course, I had to kill myself to get into shape because, as I said, I struggled with my weight my whole life. And so I was doing ridiculous workouts and um you know i knew i was never going to win the swimsuit competition by any stretch of the imagination but i had to be competitive and i couldn't get a zero even though it was only 10 percent of the score so i had to work really you know really hard and i, I hearkened back to the discipline that i had in my life from 
from my music. So anyway, um, that just, you know, it happened to all work out. It's the toughest job I've ever had. I mean, you're, you're really, on, yeah, you're on, you're on call like 24 seven to have to be, um, on basically and giving big speeches in front of people that are much wiser and older than you. Um, and it is how I got into television because the first week that I was in Miss America, they put me on this television show. You're probably too young to remember it, but it was called um, Bloopers and Practical Jokes with oh, Ed McMahon and Dick Clark. Mm -hmm. And so they were pr playing a practical joke on me. And they were having me um, talk about a satellite system that I knew nothing about in front of 5,000 engineers. But there were other people on the stage with me. So they said, you don't have to know anything about it. It's fine, which was not my nature at all. I was, I was asking a lot of questions. And... So, of course, they start the whole thing, and then one by one, all the people on the stage get called off the stage. Their mic didn't work. They had an emergency phone call. And all of a sudden, <laughs> I'm the only one left on stage with this satellite system. And the floor director goes, oh, my God, we're coming to you live early in five, four, three, <laughs> two, just start talking. So I'm thinking I'm addressing 5,000 engineers about a satellite system I know nothing about. <laughs> and I start giving my little Miss America spiel that I've known for about a week. You know, hi, I'm Gretchen Carlson, and I'm so honored to be here today, and blah, blah, blah. And I stopped talking after about a minute, and he goes, oh, no, you have 13 more minutes to fill. And I went, what? And so I started just talking about a satellite system that I knew nothing about, and they had all these cue cards, and every word was 14 letters long. They dropped them on the floor, and then I was reading them upside down oh my God. on the floor, and I'm thinking the whole time I'm doing this, they're going to fire me from this job. <laughs> and six months later, this silly show aired. And did they tell you immediately after, or did you not yeah, find no, out no, until on, after okay. 14 minutes of hell? <laughs> they came back on the stage, and I pressed a button, and they said, "Gretchen, you've been on bloopers and practical jokes." What did and you learn about yourself in that 14 minutes? That I could do anything. <laughs> that was the really most painful experience of my life, like being on a platform where I wasn't prepared. That mm. was just so not me. And to have to pull the rabbit out of the hat and and make up stuff like that. So when it aired, a couple TV agents saw it. And I was so embarrassed. I was in a hotel room with like the covers over my eyes by myself. And I was embarrassed of myself, sitting there watching this thing like humiliated. And then the phone rang and they were like, if you can do that, you can do TV. And that's how I got into TV. How, where did you learn to hold yourself to um, such a high standard? Um, I think it was the way that I was raised with parents who believed in me. But also, I think a lot of that is um, innate. Because sometimes I wish I could turn it off. Mm. Um, the fire in my belly and the brain that never stops uh, is, it can be a positive, but it can also be a negative. You know. What does failure look like and what would that feel like to you? Oh, I've had a ton of failure. I think it's actually uh, really important to admit our failures and talk openly about them. And I can say that because I didn't talk about one of my biggest failures for a ton of years, which was getting fired from my job when I was well into my prime and I had just gotten married. And a week after my honeymoon, I was fired and told that I would be fine now that I had a husband. Yes. And I um, had been part of a two female local news team, which we were the first in the country to be two females doing primetime newscasts. So it was very provocative and progressive. And it didn't work. And the other woman was from Cleveland. So she was sort of like the hometown hero and sweetheart. And so I was the logical one to go. And I didn't do anything wrong, but it didn't feel good. Um, and I, you know, being married in that transition was tough enough. Mm -hmm. And I was in my 30s already. And established in my career and I was just so incredibly embarrassed and I mean I remember reading the headlines like of course they all went back to the Miss America thing and like um, you know bye bye Miss America bye remember that song and that was the headline in the newspaper and I remember sitting in the bathroom and just sobbing because getting fired is such a lonely experience and such a humiliating experience and um and I knew in my heart that to get another job in television, I was going to have to move. And I just got married. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure on me of, of failure. And then also like... How soon after Miss America was that? This was years after. I was 22 when I was Miss America. So then I, you know, I, my first job was in Richmond, Virginia. Then I went to Cincinnati. Then I went to Cleveland. 
while I was in Cleveland, I met my husband on a blind date and I was promoted to this main anchor role. And then we got married and then I was fired. So I was out of work for a, the first full year of our marriage. I'm wow. sure I was wonderful to live with. Wow. Um, for such a high achiever. Mm -hmm. And now you're put into a dynamic with a partner where we're not competitive with our partner, but we want to pull our weight, right? Oh, and yes. we want to be worth something and be of value. And um, that had, I mean, what did, um, how did your, how did your husband handle well, it? Well, I'm sure it was not fun for him because I was a miserable mess. And yeah. like I said, being married is a really difficult transition. Yeah. Being married in, is hard anyway. It's being hard. Yeah. And in and of itself. And then yeah. when you're miserable, um, and I knew in the back of my mind that I was going to have to move. And so after a year, I did, ironically, my boss in Cleveland moved to Dallas and she wanted to hire me. And so I had to move to Dallas, which was great. Which meant he had to move to Dallas. Which meant he stayed in Cleveland. So then our Whoa. second year of marriage, we commuted. Huh. And then how'd he, that conversation go? I know. And it was, Wait, how'd it go when you said you like? Well, what did he think when he, you said I want to go to Dallas? I know. Well, on our third date, I had warned him a little bit. I I said, <laughs> don't call me back unless you want to move to New York City, eventually, because that's where I'm going. And you know, I was in my. God, I wish I had your confidence. I'm like, where do you live? I'll move there. <laughs> <laughs> I have moved for so many. I mean, I'm always the one to move, which has caused me my own pain, but. But good for you. Yeah. Well, I was old enough at that point that, you know, I was like ready to stand up, I guess, for... Wait, old enough. How old were you? I was 31. Okay, well, I'm 37 and, and I'm still moving. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, everyone... Listen, I'm not saying that people should do necessarily yeah. what I did, but I knew that that's where I wanted to be. Yeah. And luckily, he said, that's where I want to be. He didn't realize that I, we were going to go to Dallas in between. So he eventually... Um, moved there. But it was, the second year was really hard because this was before, like, this was still when you had to have the Saturday night stay to get the airfare that was reasonable. Um, you're probably, again, too young to remember this, but you had to have, you had to have a Saturday night stay to get an airfare that was like under $200. Otherwise it was like a thousand dollars. Well, I was working weekends, so we couldn't have a Saturday night stay if I was going to go back to Cleveland. So there was, there were times when we didn't see each other for three, four weeks. Um, wow. So it was, you know, it was it was difficult. He eventually came to Dallas, and then we were there together for ten months. And then, luckily, I got a job with CBS News in New York, and we both we both went there. So, listen, failure is it sucks when it's happening, but I believe that it is essential to appreciating success. And you know, I have had many other failures in my life, and I'm lucky to have had them because it makes me appreciate the glory of finding success, you know, so much more. Mm -hmm. So you work at CBS, mm -hmm. and what year was that then? I was there from 2000 to 2005, and my first assignment was actually Hillary Clinton's Senate run in New York City, except that was the same night that Bush and Gore were facing off in the presidential election, as you recall, there was something called the Haining Chads in Florida. Mm. And so I was promptly then assigned to cover Gore, which meant I had to go to D.C. And I pretty much was there for a long time. So then my husband was saying, um, I thought we moved to New York and now you're living in D.C. <laughs> I was like, I'm so sorry. You know, so um, so I covered, a, you know, major stories of national, you know, national news when I was at CBS and international stories, too. Um, and then I was eventually promoted to do the Saturday early show at CBS, which is what I, I always wanted to do a morning show. Yeah. What was your ultimate goal once you started in the TV realm? Um, I don't even know if politics was something that you were passionate about or not, but mm. I, I feel like you're quite a goal-oriented person and mm -hmm. in, in dreaming into the what things could be. What was your ultimate goal with TV? Was doing a morning show five days a week. Politics I got thrown into at my first job. Again, because I had a female leader who believed in me. I've had great female and male bosses, but um, and they all pushed me, but I think the most pivotal bosses were, were the women. And when I was 23 years old, she said to me, you're now the political reporter. And I said, I am. Mm. And at that time in Virginia, there weren't a lot of us. <laughs> so this was a big deal to be <laughs> a, a female reporter covering the governor. Um, so I got, I got the bug for, for politics. 
But my real goal was to do a morning show because it's a compilation of hard news and soft news and being able to show your personality. And when I used to send my mom tapes of my early reporting tapes, videotapes, VHS, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> um, and I would send them to her and, and she would call me up and she'd be like, I think you're doing a fine job, she said, but I just really wish you could smile a little more and show your personality while you're doing TV. And I was like, Mom, I'm covering fires and triple homicides. Yeah. <laughs> She's like, I know, but you could still smile a little bit. And I was like, Mom, that doesn't work that way. So when I finally got to morning TV, she was like, oh, now, you know, now people can see that you have a sense of humor and you're also smart, you know, covering the news stories of the day, but you can have fun and you can even do cooking segments. And so it was a wonderful, you know, compilation of of everything. And that's really how I ended up at Fox was because mm -hmm. at CBS, I was just doing that one day a week and being mm -hmm. a correspondent. Mm -hmm. And at Fox, I was given an opportunity to do that five days a week. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I thought that that was going to be an amazing experience for me. It didn't turn out that way. No. no. Um, so it was 2015. What was the, what year, what year was it that, um, that the sexual harassment was revealed. That I brought my case? Mm -hmm. July 6th, 2016. So what was 2015 like? like <laughs> let's just go back to like before that. Well, here's the Because you had been there since then. What year did you start with Fox? My son was right, So you've been there old. a while. Yes. Um, yes. But the problem is because, um, because of the way in which we solve sexual harassment cases in our society, we silence women through NDAs oh, yeah. and through settlements. So I can't tell you what it was like. That's the unfortunate consequence. Well, then we should talk about that because I um, the, I don't want to get the uh, ending forced arbitration for sexual harassment. Is that the actual case? Like that's the actual mission, or that's is that my just the bill? Okay, that's the bill. So, so after after um, I filed my lawsuit on July 6, two thousand sixteen, I had no idea what was going to happen. I mean, this was the ultimate risk of my life, and. Um, you know, the way I characterize it was jumping off the cliff completely by myself with no safety net below. I had no idea what to expect from one minute to the, to the next day to the next week. And I could have never known so many things that happened, like that they would start an investigation. Wow. You know, um, on that, you, on the whole situation, you know, and that he, my perpetrator would be fired in two weeks. Wow. I mean, all the discussions with my attorneys before were like, oh, they'll, they'll try to save him, you know, and nothing will happen to him and everyone will malign you for sure, which did happen. Um, so there were a lot of things that turned out for the positive that I could have never predicted. And then, you know, 15 months later, the whole Harvey Weinstein situation and the whole Me Too movement exploded. And then yeah. really the floodgates opened at that point yeah. in time. And we, we got into this whole cultural revolution. Mm -hmm. And I started working on trying to make it better for women all across our country almost immediately because I started hearing from all of these women mm -hmm. almost immediately after I filed my case. And I realized then that this is a pervasive epidemic. I didn't know that when I filed my case because when you do something like this, you're so alone and it, you're made to feel like it's only happening to you. And what I came to find out was that it crosses every socioeconomic line in every profession. So I was hearing from members of our military, police officers, firefighters, teachers, lawyers, um, airline mechanics, uh, Wall Street bankers, of course, other journalists. It was everywhere. And the scary thing was that almost all the stories were eerily similar in the sense that I finally found the courage to, came, to come forward and I was promptly blacklisted, demoted, and fired. And the majority of these women, 99% of them that reached out to me by the thousands, have never worked in their chosen profession ever again. And that's outrageous. And that's when I knew that I had to do something to change it. So with arbitration, which I can relate to this scenario, I had my own situation with a race team where they weren't paying me correctly, and I was asking for documents and questioning things. They weren't giving me what I wanted. So in my contract, it says it's four star, It's arbitration is the only way you can go through things if you want to have a lawyer involved. And 
I got to arbitration because there's all kinds of steps before it, right? It can end in mediation. Um, you know, there's steps before, but we went all the way to the end, which is arbitration. And I was on a five year gag where I couldn't talk about any of the stuff that happened and what they did and how much money they didn't pay me. And, and the thing was, is I won. I actually won. I, st- I mean, when you can, when you take into account the legal fees, I you know won a little bit, right. <laughs> but I still essentially won. Mm. And it's just a horrible process where they. And then there's I learned another term, which is like split the baby, mm. um, which is where basically like an arbitrator will just kind of like ah eh, you kind of won, but nobody really lost, right? right? Nobody really because I mean I was going for triple damages and being treated like an employee, but I was an independent contractor. There was all kinds of layers to it, but I had to go through arbitration, mm-hmm. and then I couldn't talk about it at all. Right. So you're gagged, and this is the way in which companies have decided to solve harassment issues because they can cover up all their dirty laundry because it's a secret process. As a company, you'd want arbitration because of course you, you want anything arbitration. that happens, you know nobody would know. Because exactly. the only reason you'd have to be go to any uh, court or is if you did something wrong. Right, so a couple of points. Arbitration was never intended to be used in this way. It was to settle small little disputes that arise in the workplace. Mm. And so to suddenly move like discrimination and harassment and assault into this secret chamber was not the intent when the Supreme Court ruled on this more than 20 years ago. So that's the first problem. And and the second issue is that people don't understand what they're signing when they sign their employment contract. Sure. You know, as a as a highly educated woman, I didn't understand what that clause meant. And you add into that that when people start new jobs, they don't expect to get into disputes. Of course not. Like I know I didn't. Like, did I ever think this was going to be on my resume for the rest of my life? Like, I'm going to suddenly become one of the poster children for harassment in the workplace? I mean, it's not something I aspired to. But so there's all these things working against you. When you when you find out you have an arbitration clause, that's a dark day. And I remember the day my lawyers said to me, this is a dark day for you because you don't have a case anymore. And I said, what do you mean? They said, because nobody's ever going to know about this. And Danica, you and I would not be having this conversation right now had my lawyers not figured out a strategy that exposed a loophole for them to be able to sue my perpetrator personally instead of Fox News. Wow. So that is the way in which my case became public and why we're even sitting here today um, discussing this cultural at revolution. At all. Discussing it at all. Right. Because it would have never surfaced. No. It, because there are... The other common thing that all these women said to me when they reached out to me is, thank you for being the voice for the voiceless, because nobody ever heard their voice. People didn't care, number one. And number two, nobody ever heard their voice because they were in this secret chamber. So if you're you're not forced into arbitration, then the other way we settle these cases is settlements. And what comes in settlements? Secrecy, NDAs, Mm non-disclosures. Women can never tell you anything. So in the last couple of weeks, the group of us at Fox have come together, the women there who signed settlements and NDAs, and we are demanding to be released from them. What is, are you not ever allowed to say anything? No. It's a lifetime gag. mm -hmm. So people can go read my complaint and they can see what my allegations were, again, because we were able to make that public. Three years ago when I signed my settlement, it was very progressive because I got a public apology that never happens. And I also was given the ability to work and talk about this issue, which I have taken to heart and have done every single day since. Mm, Good for you. If I would have known that we would have come this far in such a short period of time, I would have thought long and hard about signing that NDA aspect of it. Of course. But back then, I was already getting this apology and you know, the ability to work on this issue now we only feel it's fair to go into the next phase of the revolution, which is to release women from these NDAs so that they can finally have a voice about what exactly happened to them. That's the only way we're going to solve this, is to continue to have a national dialogue about it and give women their voice back. I feel for me with whatever issues going on with me, I need to either talk about it or be able to write about it. There needs to be some form of purging, some form of what I would kind of describe as like an alchemy within you where where you're able to transform an emotion and either get it out of you and and make it 
turn it into something else. And the fact that you can't say anything means that all those emotions just sit in you mm -hmm. and your truth is not told. And how do you heal from that? Because I'm helping so many other women and I'm doing it for them. It doesn't, you know, it matters, I guess, to me because there are movies and television miniseries being done on my story and I can't participate in those. Yeah, how are they even accurate? That's, how are those well, they're even not, accurate? They're, they're, they're not potentially. So that can be frustrating and strange. Of course. So I have to look at it from the big picture. I have to rise above that and look at it from the big picture and say, as long as we're having this national dialogue and we're having movies on this, they would have never done movies on this three years ago. So as long as we're doing this, then we're helping women. And if even one other woman sees this movie or miniseries and feels the courage to come forward, then it's worth it. So I can still do a tremendous amount of work without being able to say, on September 14th, 2005, this happened to me in his office, okay? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it'd be nice to be able to tell the whole story mm -hmm. and that's why we're fighting for it, I but I can continue someday. to do my work and I'm incredibly optimistic that the ending arbitration act of yeah. sexual harassment is going to pass, yeah. which will give women the voice that they need to not be forced into that secret chamber of arbitration. I really feel it's like the final part of the tipping point of mm -hmm. the revolution because it, when you when you leave the power dynamic like this, where you have the perpetrator with the hand way up high, mm -hmm. because the woman's down here because he knows she's silenced, mm -hmm. right? But you suddenly give her a voice, and mm -hmm. look what happens. Now she's up on the same playing field, and that changes the entire dynamic within yeah. the workplace. Yeah, it might even encourage this person to not sexually harass to begin with. Right. So, I think it's it's a crucial. Um, part of this equation. And by the way, my bill is bipartisan because after covering politics for almost 30 years, I realized that unless sure. it is bipartisan, it's never going to pass. Right. So the scope is very limited. It's small. It's, it's enough for Republicans who tend to not be in favor of this to, to get on board. Um, I have a bipartisan coalition in the House and in the Senate. And I remain incredibly optimistic that we're going to get this done for women. What is the downside to why it wouldn't be passed? Oh, gosh. Um, we have organizations like the National Retail Association and the Chamber of Commerce working against us because they feel that it will um, open up the floodgates for frivolous lawsuits. But the beauty of my bill is that it's only about harassment. Yeah, It's only about harassment. So unless you have stuff to cover up, why are you against it? Yeah, I agree. What, what advice would you have for women that might be, or a man, who might be in a scenario where they are uncomfortable. And in my mind, that's the great question is what's the line? Mm -hmm. When is the line crossed? And so number one, how do you know when the line is crossed? And then what is your advice if you really feel like it has been. So there are two forms of sexual harassment in the workplace. One's pretty easy to discern. It's quid pro quo. I've been hearing a lot about that in the, in the real world <laughs> um, with politics, but it essentially means, you know, sleep with me for the promotion or you're fired. Um, and you'd be surprised how much that still goes on. That mm -hmm. obvious. Um, a woman reached out to me who I included in my book, who simply asked for a promotion in radio and her boss just two years ago, asked her to get up on the desk and spread them. Was so, he joking? No, nope. like was this a nope. This is a real question. Oh no, and this is that's that is a typical story that I hear. There's no gray in any of that. That's pretty black and white. That's quid pro quo. The other definition of sexual harassment is a hostile work environment, and that's where subjectivity comes in, mm -hmm. because what I might think is hostile, you might not. Mm -hmm. So if there's an off-color joke. Mm -hmm. Or there's a, hey, you know, I really like your boobs in that dress. We know that's wrong, right? But some person might not be offended by that, but, but another person might. Right. So that's where the issue is allowed to become more difficult because now you have people saying things like, well, I can't even compliment a woman on her blue dress. And, and I say to that, no, you can still say 
hey, I like your hair or I like your dress. Nobody's going to sue you over that. You know, it's kind of a cop out. As long as these really incredibly horrible things are still happening and being said to women, I don't think we should worry so much about the subjective nature of it because the quid pro quo stuff is going on every single day in a ton of workplaces. And that's why we need to continue the national dialogue about it because um, we need to hold people accountable for this, for this kind of behavior and take away the myths that have surrounded this and subjugated women and kept them down for so long where they didn't feel like they could speak up. Because what happens to them when they do? They're promptly blacklisted, demoted, and fired, and maligned. So I'm so hopeful to see the progress that we have made. And I think we've made great strides in three major areas. When women come forward now, they're actually believed. I mean, that's huge. Number two, um, perpetrators are being held accountable almost immediately. They're, they're being fired. And the general public is interested in these stories. That, that is huge because when the public is interested, that means that the media will continue to cover the stories as well. And I think one of the reasons that the general public got so pissed off was that they were like, why didn't we know about these stories? How could these horrible Harvey Weinstein sure. allegations be happening? And we didn't know about it as a society. Sure. Things that seem to be even known in the community right. like, don't get well known. You're like, what? So I bring you full circle to why we didn't know about it. Because we have decided to solve this issue in secrecy. That's how we've solved it. And that's why the American public didn't know about it. And they're pissed. And they don't want it for their kids. And they don't want it for their wives and their sisters and their aunts. So, you know, that's how this revolution has steamrolled ahead and has continued. The movement has continued. I mean, there's a, there's, there's a lot of progress to be made and there's still a lot yeah. of work to do. Yeah. But I remain optimistic. About so it. to close the loop on what if you're in the scenario, if oh, yeah, sorry, a man or advice. woman, yeah, just what do you do? You mm -hmm. know, you're, the line you established the two different kinds of sexual harassment, one being far more black and white than the other one. But of course, you know, you still can get that gut feeling in your stomach of like, whoa, that was super inappropriate or mm -hmm. like. You've done that four times now, and I don't think you're kidding anymore. Well, um, yeah, you have to speak then, up. So you have to tell the person because you have to have it on the record that that you have told the person that you don't appreciate that got it. behavior. Um, chapter four of my book, Be Fierce, is a whole game plan for women. It's a 12-point plan. Um, it's probably the first time that it's ever been laid out that succinctly for women mm -hmm. because it's incredibly important that you have a plan. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll just give you the top three points. You have to gather evidence. You know, we live in this he said, she said culture and people can just glom on to, you know, well, I don't believe her because she doesn't have any evidence. Well, many times in these cases, you don't. And so you have to try and figure out a way that you can have evidence. And if you can't have hard evidence, you have to then, number two, tell somebody that you trust and in the workplace so that you have a witness and that you documented that you told this person on a specific date what happened to you. Mm -hmm. And then number three, you must document it. You have to keep a journal, um, keep any kind of documentation so that you can you know, help to prove your case. And don't go to complain about it to HR until you have all of this, all of your ducks mm. in a row. Because once you go to complain, you can't go back to do your plan. Mm. And I, was, I would also advocate that you don't actually even go to HR, which is a whole other story. Really? Because HR doesn't really work for you. They work for the company. Yeah, of course. So I advocate for companies to have an independent ombudsman who looks at these cases from an independent point of view, mm. because otherwise you get sucked into the old school ways of the way that they've handled these, which is let's get rid of the woman. Let's figure out how to get rid of the, the troublemaker over here. Find something and she did. Just find, let, let's make it go oh, no, away. No, no, they don't even have to do that. They oh, can just, fun. Yeah. That's called retaliation. Oh. And, and they can just fire you for simply having the courage for coming forward. It's not legal, but they do do it. <laughs> Um, and they, they'll wow. do everything to save the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. so, so then get a lawyer. You need to get a lawyer, a lawyer then is the final step. I would step. at least get legal advice. That's number four. Yeah. Um, so that you know what you're up against because every state has different rules with regard to gathering evidence. Sure. So sure. in 11 states, for example, you can't tape record somebody without two-party mm. consent. Um, and mm. it's actually a felony in California. Oh, wow. 
So you need to, you yeah. know, know where you are and, yeah. and what your state laws are. That's good. That's, I mean, that's just, it's calls to action if you're in that scenario. It's one thing to hear. It's another thing to know what the heck to do next mm -hmm. when you feel like that's you. Um, or go get your book, Be Fierce, and it will lay it all out mm -hmm. and you can revisit that. Um, so, like, I'm getting this feeling as, do I understand that you're ready to get back into TV, that you want to start being on television again? Yeah, doing, I have been. You have been. So I've been doing documentaries for A&E Networks on Lifetime. Okay. And I just completed my third one. What are they on? Because um, so I'm sensing first, something about this whole scenario and giving a voice to women. But anyway, that's just yeah, my idea. So the, the idea. first one was a two-hour documentary. It was called Breaking the Silence, and it was on the every woman's story of harassment because I really wanted to focus on the women that didn't have a national platform because that's the majority of the women. So mm -hmm. McDonald's workers, firefighters, mm -hmm. nursing home workers. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, and so I traveled all around the country last summer putting that one together. And then I just did two documentaries uh, one-hour documentaries, one on this uh, cult called the Nexium cult that was actually in New York State, wow. um, and another fierce woman brought them down to to get her mm. get her daughter out of the cult. Mm. And then I did my last one on the college admission scandal, which oh, wow. was incredibly um, enlightening. Where can we see these documentaries? Um, they're on they're on video on demand, or they're on the Lifetime TV dot com um, website or the app. Yeah, so I feel like that's such an it's such a fantastic. I I'm um, consuming my information. I'll be honest, I don't really watch the news anymore, mm -hmm. and I kind of want to ask you about that in specific. But I get it from documentaries, from mm -hmm. well thought through, detail oriented, deep dives on topics, and not just a blurb that comes out in thirty seconds on the news in the morning or the news at night. Um, or something in the newspaper even, or something on social media. That's a fantastic way to really be thorough about the about a topic. So mm -hmm. that's amazing that you're doing documentaries. Yeah, do, you, think, do you have plans to do more? Yeah, and I think that you know it's been really fascinating for me to go back into longer form storytelling like yeah. that, rather than just doing a daily news show where it's live is exciting, but yeah. then you know, you're right. It's kind of just like 30 seconds here, 30 yeah. seconds there. And this gave me the opportunity to really do that yeah. deep dive. But the most important thing about it was that I could go back to the craft and passion that I love and that I have mm -hmm. um, put my time and effort into mm -hmm. for more than 25 years and to be a beacon of hope to work again, mm -hmm. a beacon of hope for all those women who have not been able to return yeah. to their careers. And there are thousands of them, maybe more, simply for having the courage to come forward. And so it was incredibly important to me to be able to work again. Yeah. And, um, and now I'm, I'm in the process of developing um, a ton of other television projects uh, from TV shows to also dramas, um, scripted dramas that I'm coming up with. And, um, you know, so really the, the world is your oyster or whatever that phrase is. I mean, that's the way I'm looking at it now. Like I have so many ideas and, and projects and yeah. so I'm pitching them and, uh, so I'm excited what to be making you some done? announcements. That doesn't even shock me, Gretchen, because you've done so many different things mm. to such a high level that um, it's still impressive. But um, given your track record, it doesn't surprise me that you're still doing amazing things. Um, so one question, though, well, it might end up being a couple, but news real quick. Mm. So I don't. How do we know what to trust? Like, I don't want to watch the news anymore. I don't either. And I'm a journalist. So I get it. I mean, it's, um, we're in this era of, of such hyper-partisan time that it's just ugly. And I've always been a registered independent. And I feel like that voice nobody cares about anymore. And it's 43% of the American population. 43% of us now identify as independent. Does anyone and, really want to be all the way over here or all well, the way over here? You really kind of want someone in between anyway. Well, that's how I, I'm not. Don't tell that to the to both sides because that's, you know, they're vicious about their their points of view. And, you know, hats off for having a passion about something. But I think it's doing great harm to our country because we're focusing on, on both of these extremes and mm. we're forgetting all of these people in the middle who yeah. actually might be interested in compromise and getting stuff done. Yeah. And at least that's my particular viewpoint. Um, I'm a I'm a doer, and 
the idea that we just sit around and bicker and fight and not get anything accomplished is not productive to me at all and a detriment to our country. So um, I'm with you on not watching the news. And it's quite honestly why I haven't necessarily missed not being Mm. part of the mix over the last Mm. How has it felt to not really be so, I don't know, I would think you may lose touch with a little bit of it. A little bit, but it's been kind of liberating because... You know, it was such a uh, a monumental task every day of every year of every month to make sure that you never dropped the ball and you're yeah. always on top of everything. Mm-hmm. I've I've kind of been relieved to not be covering Amazing. this hyperpartisan time, but also this era of fake news. Yeah, um, I have been fortunate enough to not be labeled as such because I yeah. haven't been doing a daily news cycle, and yeah. I think that's also been tremendously detrimental to the business of of journalism. Yeah. Um, I don't know how you get those people back who actually believe that outlets that they just don't like the tone of or the mm-hmm. opinion that they now think that's fake. Mm-hmm. I don't know how you get those people back yeah. into believing in news and journalism again. Well, it feels like news is so one side or the other. Like you're at Fox, so you're a Republican, or you're CNN, and you're a Democrat. And it seems like, well, I don't even know what to watch. What if I'm in the middle, the 43%, which is because there's a part of my life that feels kind of Democratic, and there's a part of my life that feels kind of Republican. Right. So where do I watch TV where I'm not just being what would feel like brainwashed? Mm-hmm. And I would love if there, I mean, I think it would be fascinating if there was no party anymore and we actually had to listen to everyone. Mm -hmm. We had to listen to what you say and what you want to do and where you stand on things. And then it doesn't, it eliminates also the casual voter or the casual person that just goes, I'm going to vote for this because that's who I am. And I'm from here. I'm from here. And this is what I vote for. You know, it takes away the, um, I don't know, the the team, mm-hmm. and it makes you actually have to listen. And so the people that are going to play a part in who is running their state or running your country uh, will be from someone who's actually listened mm-hmm. and has a real belief in someone based on what they've said, not red or blue. Mm-hmm. I'm with you. Uh, but until we fund monetarily an independent party in this country, I'm not so sure that's going to happen. Mm-hmm. So... You know, people who are independents can't get the, the kind of big bucks it takes to be able to run for office. And so you you kind of have to make that decision on, unless you're already well known um, in the political arena. So and then, you know, not to get into the whole political process, but the way in which we have primaries and all of that, you um, you get stuck on the issues. You mm-hmm. get stuck on the issues that divide our parties. Mm-hmm. So abortion, immigration, you know, some of the big ones and people won't come off of those stances at all. So you're never going to find probably agreement on that. But I believe there are a lot of other issues that we could be discussing. And I always like to point to the female congressional softball team as a good role model. They play together Democrats and Republicans on the same team. Okay. And what do the men do? They play the Democrat team and the Republican team. (laughs) And I think we need a little bit more female softball team of congressional members in our lives, which is to come together, whether or not you agree with anything that your you know, softball mate thinks or not, at least you're showing compromise by coming together and playing on the same team. And maybe, just maybe, over that practice, you might actually come to compromise on some sort of a policy as well. Hmm, at least listen, it's a start. Be open-minded. Hmm. Yes. Hmm, add a feminine touch to it. Yes. Or just an open-mindedness, and that's just the generalization of the masculine energy versus the feminine energy. Mm-hmm. Um, so if there was one place to find your news... I mean, where do you go? What's your, what do you trust the most? So my biggest piece of advice to the American public is to watch something that you don't agree with at least one hour a week. Great advice. And people look at me and they go, oh, I can't. And I'm like, you have to. So what I do is I channel surf now. When I have mm-hmm. time, I, I go from one to the next. And it's been kind of fun because I'm able to see all the colleagues that I've known for forever and ever, but I actually get to watch them now. <laughs> and I have great respect for, for so many of them. But I think it's really important to watch something that you don't agree with because we've gotten really complacent as Americans where we only watch what we want to hear. Mm. And how do we then live and learn and grow and come to a common understanding with one another if we're constantly being pummeled with the same rhetoric and we don't ever step outside of the box to hear Never something Never mind else? the social 
aspect, which is through Instagram, Twitter, mm -hmm. Facebook, Google searches, all of that stuff. They're learning your mannerisms, your habits, your preferences, mm -hmm. all the way down to what colors you like. Mm -hmm. And they're just populating you with more of that. So mm -hmm. now, not only your things that you don't even think are feeding into your preferences, you're watching it on TV too, just one thing. So I think that's fantastic advice mm -hmm. to watch, force yourself to pay attention to something, read something, watch something that you do not agree with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great advice. Um, what uh, what do you feel like is your greatest lesson in life so far? Uh, realizing that you can actually jump off that cliff and survive. And as scary as it is and was, that um, it was worth it. And not just for me, but for all the other women who never had a voice and for my children. My children were my paramount concern and I've seen the gift of courage pass to them. And that's what keeps me going because I worried about them a lot. And they both have exhibited courage well beyond their years as as a result and so I know that what I did was worth it just for my two kids and I could just like wrap everything up and say okay I'm done that that was enough but I know that it's also helped so many other people and it you know it really is about eradicating it for our generation but for sure for our next generation once and for all I mean <laughs> we just have to get past this we've got to treat women fairly pay them fairly, promote them, put them in the boardroom. Um, and we need men to help us do that. So it's all about how we, um, it's all about how we educate our kids and more so our boys than our girls. And that's what I've learned. It's probably mm -hmm. the biggest lesson. We do a fantastic job of empowering our girls. In fact, girls outpace boys in high school graduation, in college graduation, in grades. Um, but we don't tell them the real truth about what might happen to them when they get into the workplace. That's the first thing. And with the same amount of importance, we don't focus on our boys to teach them how to respect girls and women. And that's really the key in this whole discussion. So if we continue to not pay attention to our boys, we're not going to fix the problem. We have to get to them at a young age to get them to respect their sisters and their mothers and their aunts the same way in which we hope that they will eventually respect their female colleagues in the workplace. That is essential. I've spoken to one all boys school. That's where I should be spending most of my time. But most of those boys schools, for whatever reason, haven't been brave enough to broach the subject or bring me in. That to me is the most important audience. And then to men who currently control most of the dynamics still in the workforce. Most of the Fortune 500 companies, they're making most of the decisions. We need them. This is not about male bashing. This is about reaching out to them and saying, help us, please. Pay us fairly, promote us, put us in the boardroom. Because guess what doesn't happen when you do that? subjugation of women in many forms, including sexual harassment. It's a culture. Mm -hmm. We need a culture shift. Yes. And I believe that with your good work and others who are speaking up about men and women, both tapping into the strength and the vulnerability and the care and the softness, and we can mend these feminine and masculine energies within all of us, we are one generation away if done aggressively and right we're always one generation away from eliminating an issue mm -hmm. yeah we thought we had come a lot farther on this one than we actually have but now that we're talking about it that's the way we solve it well let's keep talking yes thank you for thank having you, me danica you're welcome thank you Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.